Well, good morning and welcome to this service of Holy Communion on the fifth Sunday of Lent and the beginning of Passion Tide. As we come into the presence of the Lord, let us pause for a moment, bringing our cares, our anxieties and our fears to his feet, certain that he is with us. We meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so the collect for this, the fifth Sunday of Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and they were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord, only you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and shall cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place on your soul, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 130, and the response is, O my soul waits for the Lord. O my soul waits for the Lord. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. 
If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you shall be feared. O my soul waits for the Lord. I wait for the Lord, and my soul waits for him, in his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the night, more than the night and the morning, more than the night watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. O my soul waits for the Lord. Our second reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, will he will be all right? Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. So then Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were there with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. 
He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. But Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus, looking upwards, said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An elderly man who lived alone wanted to dig a sizeable vegetable patch where he grew potatoes. But it was backbreaking work and his son, who had always done it for him, had recently been sent to prison for burglary. His dad mentioned this to him in a letter saying that he decided he wasn't going to grow potatoes anymore. But his son felt really bad for his dad and so writing back he said, Dad, for goodness sake, don't dig up the potato garden because that's where I buried the stuff from the burglary. At about 4am the following morning, a police van arrived full of officers armed with shovels who dutifully then dug the patch for hours looking for the loot but finding nothing. A few days later the elderly man received yet another letter from his son. Dear Dad, he said, under the circumstances it was the very best I could do. Now you can plant this year's potatoes. When things get bad and we are faced with difficulties, I guess we all have to learn to adapt. Someone on Facebook posted a quote yesterday which said, This is the lentiest Lent I've ever lented. Church, we are learning to adapt, to be church in a very different way. And yes, it does feel very Lenten and very sacrificial. In my reflection last Sunday, which you can still watch if you haven't seen it, I talked a little bit about making the most of what we've got. And I imagine that lots of people have been spending more time digging around the garden, cleaning out the kitchen cupboards and reflecting on how important friendship, family and the love that we share between us is. And I hope that in these days of lockdown, you have been able just to spend a little more time thinking about your own walk with God and making the most of this time that you have with him. In our gospel reading this morning, Lazarus has fallen ill. And with Jesus being a friend of the family, the first thing that they do is to ask him to come. But hearing his initial response, we might think, well, that's charming. Why didn't Jesus just come straight away, heal his friend and so cut out all of that pain and grief? He knows that his friends are going to feel rotten, not to mention, of course, saving on the expense of a funeral. The story of Lazarus is a story about one man who Jesus rescues from death. But it is also a parabolic story which tells us more about Jesus, his power and his own forthcoming experience. You'll remember, if you will, one of the readings during morning prayer this week where God tells the prophet Samuel to go to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king of Israel. And Jesse thinks that it's going to be his strongest son or maybe the most able son who is called to be king. But God tells him, do not look on the outward appearance. For while humans do look on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And so it's the heart of this story that we need to focus upon this morning. Yes, Lazarus has indeed died. That much is true. And yes, it is very sad and horrible and everyone is grieving. But death doesn't have the same finality to Jesus as it does to the rest of us. And so to his disciples, Jesus says that Lazarus has merely fallen asleep, but they don't get it. 
because they are looking only on the outward. It is not that Jesus denies what's happening or is about to happen, but more that this whole situation is going to bring glory to God and reveal that while death is indeed tragic, it will not have the final word on this man's life, nor will it for the rest of us. To that end, Jesus makes the journey towards Bethany, about a mile and a half away from Jerusalem. But the disciples are afraid. After all, in the previous autumn during the Feast of Tabernacles, the authorities had threatened to kill Jesus. Someone had tried to stone him, and a few months later they tried to arrest him. And so they are certainly wanting Jesus to keep that bit of social distancing so that he doesn't get harmed, or they. We know from where this story is set that it isn't going to be long before Jesus is crucified. And the disciples, knowing the risk that Jesus is taking, are quite nervous. Hence the response from Thomas, let us go with him that we may die also. But when Jesus finally arrives, his friend, as we heard, had already been dead for four days. And that in itself is interesting because the Jews of the time believed that for the first three days, the soul of a person stayed in the vicinity of their body, hoping to re-enter it. And so John is making sure that his readers understand that this isn't just a resuscitation. It's also true that no one in the Old Testament had ever raised somebody from the dead beyond those three days. So Lazarus's soul has long gone. And so what Jesus is about to do is indeed miraculous. As they talk, Jesus says to Martha, your brother will live again. I know she says he's going to live again in the resurrection on the last day. And that's when Jesus says those amazing words that we repeat at the beginning of every Christian funeral. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, you are not listening. In Franco Zeffirelli's depiction of the life of Jesus, a degree of poetic license is used because it is Mary that acknowledges that if Jesus had been with them, Lazarus would not have died. She says, for I believe that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you because you are the Christ, the son of God, to which Jesus says, take away the stone. But straight away, she says, but Master, his body is already decaying. Hang on a minute. Didn't Mary and Martha just say that they believed? Before we get too carried away, how often is our faith not quite where our words are? How many times do we read the words, do not be afraid, but are? Oh. How many times do we read, I am with you always and yet feel alone? How many times do we read, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, and feel anxious? This story touches and is relevant to every person in every age who, while believing the truth of what God says, sometimes struggle to live in the reality of it. We have all, of course, had those nagging questions in our heads. What if all of this is too good to be true? What if after you die, that's it? And there's nothing. Maybe you're struggling with an issue in your life today and you've been praying to God, asking for his help, but haven't had any answer and you feel as if nobody at home in heaven. What if you think you're a Christian but doubt you were sincere enough when you prayed the prayer and you worry that you're not going to go to heaven? The truth is, I think most of us struggle at times connecting what we say with our mouths and believing it enough to act upon it. The truth is there is a spiritual virus out there as well as a physical one that has been going around for centuries. It is the virus of doubt. And if you haven't yet caught it, you probably will. Everyone who has ever put their faith in Jesus inevitably has questions, hesitations and uncertainties over one thing or another. This isn't a Christian experience. It is a human experience. And so the fact that Mary tells Jesus to his face that she believes he is the son of God and yet freaks out when he tells her to take away the stone gives us hope that Jesus does not get mad when we don't quite join the dots together. And he certainly doesn't think that we are second rate Christians who don't deserve to be in his family because of our lack of faith. For in spite of Mary and Martha's questioning, Jesus still says, 
take away the stone. He still raises their brother from the dead. If everything God did relied on us, we would be in deep trouble. Because friends, this is not about us. It is about him. Everything God does is an act of his grace. I read a story about a little girl who kept pestering her dad while he tried to read a magazine. Finally, in desperation, he tore out a page on which was printed the map of the world. Tearing it into very small pieces, he gave it to his daughter and said, Go into the other room and put this map of the world back together. When you finish it, I'll put my magazine down and we can do whatever you'd like. A few minutes later, the little girl returned and handed the map correctly fitted together. Her dad was very surprised and asked how she had finished it so quickly. Well, she said, on the other side of the picture of the world was a picture of Jesus. When I got him in place, then the world came out all right. As Jesus walks towards Lazarus's grave, all the others could do was to hold their noses, watch and wait. And as they did, their world came out all right. Jesus did not cure Lazarus's illness. He did not stop him from dying. He did not take away the grief that Martha and Mary and the others felt for those four days. But in the end, it all came out all right. And you know, Jesus doesn't always do what we think or pray for either. He might not give us that job that we want. He might not cure us when we get sick. He might not do any number of things we ask God. But he always gets what he wants from God. Remember again those words of uh, Mary in the film, Jesus of Nazareth. I believe whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Those words are certainly true. For in John 6 verse 39, Jesus says this. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but I will raise them up on the last day. The story of Lazarus is a story of hope in the midst of hopelessness, a story of peace in the midst of anxiety, a story of life in the midst of death. It is not a story that papers over the reality of what we feel or what has been lost, because as human beings we need to express sorrow and dismay that comes from loss. Mary and Martha were crying, even Jesus was crying, but then something else happened. It didn't end with loss and tears. Jesus went to the tomb, called out the name of his friend, and death was defeated. Jesus always ruins funerals, and he has promised to raise the dead of all those who, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, say, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Even though it fear sometimes bangs on the door of our hearts and minds, and doubts and questions arise, for this is the sublime and absolute truth that the church has hoped on, believed in and shared for the past 2,000 years. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? It is about Jesus, not us. He has won the victory because we could not. So, my friends, let Jesus be the Christ. Let him live the life of faith in and through you, because you can't. All we have to do is watch and wait and be a part of the greatest story that has ever been told. Amen. So we say together the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. The response to holy and strong God is help us to reveal your glory. Holy and strong God, help us to reveal your glory. Father, we give you thanks for all who have helped us to grow in faith. For teachers and preachers, for shining examples, for friends and relatives. Bless all those who seek to bring others to you. All who by their goodness show the world of your goodness. Holy and strong God, help us to reveal your glory. We give you thanks for explorers and inventors, for all who extend our experience of the world and its mysteries. We remember especially all who are involved in research. We ask you to bless all who work in farming and agriculture, all who seek to provide us with food. Help us, Lord, to care for the hungry and the homeless. Holy and strong God, help us to reveal your glory. We give thanks for those who regularly sacrifice their time and energies for us. We remember especially our parents and all those who care for us. Lord, as we are loved, help us to show love to others. We ask especially your blessing today on all who feel unwanted or lonely. Holy and strong God, help us to reveal your glory. We give you thanks, Father, for all medical research and for the caring of doctors and nurses. We pray for all who work in the emergency service and those who risk their lives for others. Lord, bless all who are ill, in pain or in danger with an awareness of your love and your care. Holy and strong God, help us to reveal your glory. Glory be to you, O God, for through our Saviour Jesus Christ you have opened to us the way to eternal life. We rejoice in the fellowship of all your saints, and we remember before you this day our loved ones who have been departed from us. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For at this time of his passion and resurrection draws near, 
the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden mystery. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And so as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. The Lord be with you. May Christ give you grace to grow in holiness. Deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.